Greetings and peace to you. I'm Jim Poinsett, Executive Director of the Interfaith Partnership of Greater St. Louis. And welcome to this, the first and hopefully only virtual Thanksgiving program. For those of you for which this is an annual event, you know that this is usually live, but as with most things 2020, uh, we are meeting virtually because of the pandemic. We are saddened not to be gathering in person this year, but we are grateful to have this way to connect. Wherever you are and whatever platform that you are joining us from, we are glad that you are able to be with us and hope that you are staying healthy and safe. The Interfaith Partnership of Greater St. Louis represents 34 religious and ethical communities in the St. Louis metropolitan area. We provide platforms for our diverse religious voices to be heard and promote interfaith cooperation through understanding, engagement, and advocacy. Tonight's Thanksgiving program, along with other IPSTL programs, is made possible in part by funding from the St. Louis Children's Hospital, the Law Offices of Barnett M. McKee, the Steinberg Family Foundation, Webster University, Dr. Sophia and G.S. Grewal, and Dr. Kristen Lynch. And of course, none of our work would be possible without the generosity of supporters like you. 2020 has been a remarkable, surreal, and often the baffling year. It seems difficult, perhaps even counterintuitive, to maintain a posture of gratefulness during such tumultuous times. Yet gratitude is a central practice upheld by all religions. The healing power of gratitude is undeniable, and it is probably the foremost key in finding fulfillment, especially during these challenging days. Tonight for our program, representatives from a variety of religions will reflect on the importance of gratitude for one's spiritual and emotional well-being, and explore ways gratitude is connected to religious practice and mindfulness. Now, a few notes about our program. During our program, there will be a couple of process pauses, which are designed to allow you a brief moment to reflect on what you have just heard, or perhaps jot down a few notes to yourself. You are invited to use the chat feature if you're following along on Zoom or the comment feature if you're watching on Facebook Live. And we want you to use those comment boxes to share with us the things for which you are grateful or share with us the ways that you practice gratitude or to highlight what is resonating with you that comes from our speakers this evening. It is through the collective wisdom and practices of our various faith traditions that we can buoy our individual and collective well-being during these turbulent times. Together, tonight, together but apart, we can breathe in the blessings of our lives and breathe out the gratitude which will make us whole and healthy. So let's begin. It is my honor to introduce our first presenter this evening, President Michael Fuller from the Church of Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Fuller is the first counselor in the St. Louis, Missouri stake of the uh, LDS Church. President Fuller, welcome. We're glad that you are with us this evening. Good evening. It is a distinct honor to be together with uh, some wonderful people that I've been able to meet and talk with tonight. So thank you for your invitation, and I'm grateful to be here. Just to share just a few minutes of some of my reflections in regards to gratitude. I wanted to start with a quick story. Uh, one of my hobbies is to go on bike rides. And recently I came home after a bike ride in the morning uh, as the moon was just kind of still in the sky. My four-year-old grandson came out, looked up in the sky, and was thrilled to see the moon still shining, even in the daytime, in the morning. And he looked at me and he said, Papa Mike, and this is my four-year-old grandson, he said, you know what? I read in a book 
that the moon is bright because the sun shines on it. And uh, A, I was pretty thrilled to know that he's already reading and learning things, um, thanks to his great mother. Uh, and then as I've pondered that thought in the last few weeks, I've come across a, a few things that made me think about it even more. Uh, one of our church leaders recently said, I, I have felt an unusual gratitude for my sure and certain knowledge that Jesus is the Christ. As we share the light we have received from him, his light and his transcendent saving power will shine on those willing to open their hearts. The president of our church um, worldwide, who we regard as a prophet, this last week in regards to the current pandemic reflected. There is, however, a remedy, one that may seem surprising because it flies in the face of our natural intuitions. Nevertheless, its effects have been validated by scientists as well as men and women of faith. I am referring to the healing power of gratitude. Now, no matter who and what we Worship, we gather together tonight because we all believe in a supreme being. And the light from that supreme being reflects in each one of us, regardless of our specific creeds and beliefs. And this first starts in our homes. Uh, doing a little research um, in regards to my comments, I came, I learned about Diwali, the uh, festival of light in the Sikh and the Hindu religion. And in their homes, they would have small Dia lamps. Uh, that represents God's love. Of course, in the month of December, we have the celebration of Hanukkah and the menorah in many homes, also reflecting that light. And then Christmas lights in many homes this time of year as well, reflects the light and love that we receive from God. And unitedly, those different lights can join together and create a greater light. And I think it's a wonderful that we're all here together reflecting the light of our beliefs and, and, and celebrating what we, we share in common, a love for God, peace in the world, and health for all of us. Thank you for letting me share. Thank you, President Fuller. Great to have you with us. And that image of coming together uh, in the light and being the light for the world in these darkened times is uh, truly, uh, truly moving and uh, a good thing for us all to remember as we look around to count the blessings around us. For our next reflection, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Sophia Grawal, uh, a member of the St. Louis Sick Study Circle. Uh, Dr. Sophia is also a psychiatrist and also serves as vice president of the IPSTL board. Uh, Dr. Sophia, we're so happy to have you with us today. Good evening, friends and members of our diverse interfaith community of St. Louis. I would like to begin my remarks this evening by first acknowledging in light of it being National Native American Heritage Month that we in the greater St. Louis area are on the ancestral lands of the Native American tribes of the Otoe Missouriya, the Osage people, and the Illini tribe. May we always acknowledge, respect, and honor the legacy, culture, and spirit of the indigenous people who have lived on these lands long before any of us. I would also like to acknowledge that today is one of the most important days of remembrance in the Sikh faith. In the late 1600s, our ninth guru and leader, Guru Tegh Bahadur, sacrificed his life in the name of religious equality and freedom. His martyrdom occurred at the hands of His martyrdom occurred at the hands of the tyrannical Mughal Empire in defense of thousands of Kashmiri Hindus. Sikhs honor his sacrifice as a reminder to stand up to injustice at all times. Thanksgiving is meant to be a holiday of reflection and gratitude. 
reflection on the many events of one's individual life in context of what is transpiring around us in our local, national, and global society, and gratitude for those many positive aspects of our life. Gratitudes for our family, our friends, loved ones, food, shelter, water. Being a woman of Sikh faith, I express my gratitude as often as I can to our God, who has blessed me with a life filled with love and prosperity. A saying in a scripture says, Tu data datar, tera dita khabna, meaning you are the giver, the great giver. We eat whatever you give us. I'll certainly reflect on what I have been blessed with to imbibe every day this year and absolutely be thankful to our giver. This Thanksgiving feels different for me though, and I'm sure to all, most of us too. We are in an unprecedented time globally, in the middle of a global pandemic. Many of our fellow community members are coming down with a deadly virus. And just as concerning, many of our fellow brothers and sisters, they are unemployed and facing hard times. I'm reminded of a very troubling image of tens of thousands of vehicles lined up and waiting several hours along a crowded highway to pick up food this past weekend at a food bank in Dallas, Texas. Hundreds of thousands of people, several thousand of households, not just in Dallas, but across the country, even in St. Louis, all facing economic hardship, food insecurity, unemployment, eviction, health insecurity, and the virus. Now, more than ever, we all need not just have gratitude to God, but we must commit to action out of those feelings of gratitude to help those in need in our community. In Sikhism, one of the three pillars of our faith as ordained by our founder, Gunanak Devji, is Vandke Shakna. It means the necessity to share the fruits of our labor with those less fortunate in our community. Such support to the community is not solely done out of goodwill, but out of duty. It is every six responsibility to share at least 10% of their earnings in any way to those who need it, an obligation known as the swan. In fact, community service known as seva is an integral part of the Sikhi faith. Every one of our Gurdwaras across the world has a community kitchen known as langar where free food is served to not only those in congregation, but anybody who can walk in. In fact, the world's largest communal kitchen is located at the Harmandar Sahib in Amritsar, more popularly known as Golden Temple. Up to 100,000 people, several of them homeless, are served every day there. Here at home, one of the many local food banks in the area is the Sikhs of St. Louis, who have run several food drives and food giveaways to those in need throughout the pandemic. Service to others, it helps forge community spirit. It engenders a selfless responsibility within Sikhs. Our scriptures remind us, Seva karat hoi nehkami, tisko hot parapat swami, meaning one who performs selfless service without thought of reward shall attain his Lord and master. With this sense of religious duty to practice seva or selfless service, we as six practice Thanksgiving year round. So in light of what is happening nationwide, as we grapple with this health and economic crisis, let us truly reflect on the basic necessities of life that we are fortunate enough to be blessed with by the divine grace of God. Be forever, forever grateful for those blessings. And most importantly, may we act out of gratitude and selfless service to others to help those in need here in our community. There are tough times ahead for many of our fellow brothers and sisters. And we must, in the spirit of thanksgiving and in the spirit of God here, 
as an interfaith community to the most that we each can to help out those in need. Thank you and God bless us and God bless you all. Nanak Naam Chardi Kala Tere Pane Sarbat Ka Pala Vaiguji Ka Khalsa Vaiguji Ki Fateh Thank you, Dr. Sophia, for reminding us that with gratitude comes responsibility and commitment to community. Uh, at this point, uh, we are going to go to uh, Amy Cammy, who has been uh, with us, uh, joined us tonight. We are pleased to have her. Uh, Amy Cammy is a certified musical therapist and spiritual harpist. Uh, and tonight, she, uh, we are privileged to have her uh, uh, provide us with an interactive musical meditation. Amy, so glad to have you here with us uh, tonight, and uh, we are excited to uh, participate in what you have with us for us tonight. Thank you so much. So just for clarification, I am a certified clinical musician and not a music therapist. Um, therapeutic musicians use music, music therapists use music, but we use it in different ways. Um, so for me, music is life. And it's interesting to know that in some cultures, they don't even have an extra word to describe music because it is so intertwined with life. And we embody the components of music. So tonight I wanted to just offer an example of how we are music. For example, does life feel like this sometimes? A little chaotic? to harmony. They're using the same strings. But it's about slowing down. <sighs> Finding the space between the notes. And for me, we're like this harp. We have all of these different strings which represent our feelings, our beliefs, our dreams, our fears, our experiences. And all of them create the wholeness of who we are. And sometimes we don't like to go there to the low notes, to those low vibrations We'd rather stay up here in the lightness, but the low vibrations create the fullness of our life, creates the fullness of who we are. And so for me, embracing all of these aspects of ourselves with compassion, with gratitude, helps us to be fully present in every moment with ourselves and with those around us. It's interesting to feel how we embody the components of music, the sound, that fundamental note, that thought, that feeling 
the pitch. How are we expressing ourselves? We put notes together. We put words together to create a melody. And we come together and we create harmony, which is what we're doing tonight. We're individually bringing the fullness of who we are into this moment to be together. We're rhythm. Rhythm is another component of music. We have our brain waves, our breathing and our heart rate. They are all rhythmic systems and they entrain with each other. These rhythms match each other. So with gratitude, as we slow down, our breathing changes, our heart rate slows down and our brain waves slow down. It's all connected. It's so intimately connected. And we're structure. We have schedules and routines that we do every day. We create these structures in our lives. And we can be grateful for each piece of our day as it creates the music of our lives. And there's silence. The silence between the notes, the silence between the thoughts, slowing down the chaos and transforming it into harmony within us to feel that light that we shine, we emanate, and it ripples out into our world. So right now, I would just like to offer a few minutes of therapeutic music to allow you to just close your eyes if you want, take a deep breath, connect to the rhythms of your body and allow whatever wants to come forth from within you, allow it to come to your conscious awareness right now. And whatever it is, be grateful because it's part of the wholeness of who you are. Thank you for allowing me to share.
thank you, Amy, for those warm words and those warm musical notes. And uh, just amazing to just let that wash over us and think about how uh, to find our wholeness, we must first be gratitude, have gratitude for what we have and to accept that what we, what we are and what we have is enough, enough for this world and enough for ourselves and to uh, be grateful for that and to uh, also uh, utilize that to help spread compassion uh, around those, for those around us. Thank you for your words and music this night. Okay. Friends, we have, uh, being 2020, we have, uh, uh, one of our presenters had to uh, share with us a recording video, and so we are going to hear that now. Uh, we're going to uh, give a chance to reflect on the words that Amy had, and then uh, we will hear uh, from uh, Rabbi uh, Andrea Goldstein with uh, Temple Share MF and the Jewish Mindful Mindfulness Center of St. Louis. Hi everybody, good evening. My name is Rabbi Andrea Goldstein and I am the founder and director of the Jewish Mindfulness Center of St. Louis. Uh, the Jewish Mindfulness Center is located in the North Lobby of Congregation Sher Emeth, uh, a reform synagogue in Creepcore, Missouri. But right now during this pandemic, um, everything we offer is online and everybody is welcome to attend. Um, all of our programs and sessions. Um, the Jewish Mindfulness Center of St. Louis was founded in 2018, and we offer programs and classes and opportunities that incorporate mindfulness practices into daily life um, and expand our experiences of the spiritual all within a uniquely Jewish context. Uh, when we come together for different offerings, we seek to deepen our awareness create a welcoming space for exploration of practices and foster a com um, community, a vibrant spiritual community where we try to nurture our connections with one another. The Jewish Mindfulness Center of St. Louis is really truly open to anyone, um, but in particular people who might be curious about the connections between mindfulness practice and Judaism, anyone who is hoping to deepen their personal spiritual practices, and anyone seeking a supportive community with whom to engage in mindfulness practice. So um, we hope to see you there um, sometime in the future. I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about the notion of gratitude. And um, I want to start by saying that in mindfulness practice and in Judaism, gratitude is actually not only understood to be a feeling um, that we can experience, but gratitude is really um, understood as a practice. Um, and that's what I, I wanna talk a little bit about um, today. So in mindfulness, mindfulness practice, what we are doing is trying to cultivate awareness of um, the fullness of the truth of what is happening within us and around us moment to moment without judgment and fear. And one of the truths that is happening all the time is that really, no matter what our circumstances, all of us have something that we can point to for which we can be grateful. Um, but understanding that and knowing that truth is not automatic. Um, and that's why we need to practice. In modern Hebrew, the expression for gratitude is, is not a single word. It's actually two Hebrew words. It's an idiomatic expression. Um, it's called hakarat hatov. And literally, um, while the phrase itself means to be grateful, literally those Hebrew words mean to recognize the good. Um, and so what we learn from this is that to be grateful 
um, is to acknowledge what is good, to take notice of what is good, of what is deserving of praise that is around us moment to moment. Um, and what is needed to do this is really an effort of vision, right? Of being able to see and articulate and be aware of that goodness. And so we know that gratitude is happening through um, what Rabbi Janet Martyr calls a disciplined act of the mind. Um, and what, a good question would be why? Why does gratitude have to be um, you know, so hard, so challenging sometimes? And why is gratitude, um, you know, is gratitude <laughs> available to us now during these challenging times when we're isolated from one another, when it when there's um, we're aware by reading the news of, um, you know, a quarter of a million people who have died from this virus, when there's fear about contracting this virus um, and understanding how to minimize its spread and getting everyone on board with that, right? Is this really the time that we want to um, work on feeling grateful? And I would argue, yes, this is exactly the time we want to do that because wow, um, it is true that we are immersed in a time of challenge and struggle and fear that is real and true. Um, that is not all that there is. And um, we want to stave off despair um, uh, by, by being not, not by being not by hiding ourselves away, um, but by being honest about what uh, what is true in our lives. Um, and so we are using gratitude practices as a counterbalance, right, um, to say, yes, yes, there is fear um, and there is worry and um, there is uh, pain, for sure, for sure. And that is not all there is, um, right? So why is this so challenging? So um, there's a, a great Jewish thinker um, and teacher way from way back in the 10th century. His name was Bachia Ibn Pakuda. And he actually asks this same question, right? Thousand years ago, he's, he's wondering the same thing. Why is gratitude such a challenge? And um, without the benefit of neuroscience, right? Or medical advances that we have today, um, Bachia comes up with three reasons that he says that Hakarat Hatov, the practice of gratitude requires continued effort. He says, we need, to, we need to practice this daily continuously for three reasons. The first is that we as human beings um, can never really satisfy all of um, our physical pleasures, right? We, we have what we need, hopefully, but it, that doesn't feel like enough. It feels like we need more. And so we spend a lot of our time either thinking about or actively chasing after um, things that we want or desire. Um, and we know that this is true. This is simply part of the human condition. It doesn't mean that we're bad people. It doesn't mean that we're selfish. It means that we are human. Um, and we know that this is true. We can look back to our sacred texts, right? Um, in the book of Exodus, the, the Israelites with um, God's great help are freed from their servitude in Egypt. They cross through uh, the sea on dry land. They witness incredible miracles, and you know, pretty much after after thanking God, good for them for for the for this miracle. But pretty much the first thing after that that happens is that they start to complain about um, where are they going to get food and what food are they going to eat and, and is the food going to be good enough? So, right, they're not out of Egypt really that long before the first. Um, communal activity that they engage in is, um, is this sense of complaint, um, right? That, that they're not satisfied with what they have or what has happened, but they are um, yearning, longing for, for something more, right? So that's the first reason that we need to practice gratitude. We need to be aware of what is. Second, 
The second reason that Bachia shares is that we become complacent. We take for granted the gifts that are all around us. And um, it's, it's hard to, um, to not do this, again, because this is simply what it means to be human. But um, if, we, if we know this about ourselves, then we can practice um, at, at being grateful for, for the things that we do have and not take those things around us for granted anymore. And finally, um, the mind, Bachia says this again, thousands of years, a thousand, thousand years ago, Bachia says the mind, the human mind naturally focuses on imperfection, on what is not right and is trying to fix it, um, which is a good thing, right? Um, that's, that's how we uh, get vaccines, right, by, by understanding what is wrong and working to fix it. So again, this is not a bad thing or anything to feel um, ashamed about. This is just human nature, that we are more easily focused on what is wrong in our lives, what we don't have, than what we do have. And for all three of these reasons, um, we, we need to commit ourselves to a practice of gratitude. So how do we do that? The easiest way um, is to engage in uh, prayer, prayers of gratitude, of thanksgiving. Um, our Talmud, the Jewish Talmud, says that we are to engage um, by saying 100 blessings every day. That every day there are at least 100 things that we can be grateful for. And those can be formalized prayers or they can just be the prayers of our heart. Thank you, God, for this food, for this meal. Thank you for people who care for me. Thank you for my physical abilities that help me care for others. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, if prayer is difficult, then um, you can um, try to just simply list things that are meaningful in your life um, at the end of each day. Just maybe think of one thing, one thing for which you can be grateful. And um, finally, another great practice is meditation. Um, and again, everybody is welcome to join us. We have two um, open gatherings for people to participate in mindfulness meditation practice um, twice a week through the Jewish Mindfulness Center of St. Louis. You can find us on um, the website by searching Jewish Mindfulness Center of St. Louis. Um, you can get a schedule of our sessions and we hope to see you there. Thank you so much for letting me share some time with you and I wish everyone a happy, healthy, safe Thanksgiving with lots and lots to be grateful for. Thank you. For our next reflection, I am pleased to welcome Ali Durhan, a Muslim, uh, an IPSTL board member, and he does, among other things, community relations for the Turkish American Society of Missouri. Ali, great to have you with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Jim, uh, for having me here uh, and also for leading such a meaningful conversation. And I hope and pray that all of the participants, their family members, loved ones, friends, community members are staying healthy and safe uh, during these times of uh, difficulty that we are uh, passing through as a community. And um, as earlier speaker stated, um, being thankful, gratefulness is, is a very important and major teaching in, in almost all faith traditions as well as uh, in Islam. Um, we can even say that uh, in, in our tradition, the main purpose of our creation, humankind, is to be thankful, is to praise God, is to uh, show our uh, gratefulness. In Quran, um, Allah says, we have created humans from a mixture of fluids so that we may test them and we made them hear and see. We showed them the right path, whether they choose to be grateful or ungrateful. In another verse uh, in Quran, Allah says, God says, and Allah, God brought you out of the wounds of your mothers while you knew nothing and gave you hearing, sight, and intellect. So perhaps you would be thankful. 
there are many verses um, in Quran uh, talking about being grateful, um, being uh, thankful. Uh, but in these verses that I just shared, I would like to highlight uh, some of the uh, attribute, attributes that God uh, has given us. He says he gave us hearing. He gave us um, the sight, the intellect. It means that being thankful, it needs to be an uh, active uh, action. We need to use all of those attributes, uh, listen and hear all of the blessings that uh, God has given us. We need to use our uh, intellect, all of the uni universe, the sun, the moon, the, the planets, uh, the, the clouds, water, everything is serving uh, for humanity. So we need to be uh, aware and use all of these attributes to be aware of uh, the blessing of God so we can be thankful. But unfortunately, uh, especially in our modern time, being thankful is not a very easy task uh, because uh, our time is uh, full of uh, worldly distractions, which keeps us away from God and uh, gratitude. We are distracted with, uh, with uh, the values of our life. We, we store the treasures of the world here. We are distracted with our work. We are distracted with the technology. We may even sometimes call that technology is a blessing, but think about the time that it's taking uh, out from our time. And um, we are distracted uh, with the lifestyle uh, pushed by, uh, by the media, uh, as if um, it's, which is taking uh, away us uh, from God. And I can say anything breaking our connection with God uh, can be considered uh, as a distraction which is uh, kind of a threat uh, for, for us to be thankful and grateful. And most importantly, um, Satan, um, it's evil, Satan's mission to, to uh, distract us and to, and to make us ungrateful, uh, unthankful uh, to God's uh, blessings. Uh, you might be familiar with the story in Quran. When uh, God created Adam, uh, he asked all of his angels to bow to Adam. All of the angels uh, followed his order, but Satan. Satan said, I'm superior to Adam. I'm not going to uh, bow. And he disobeyed God there. And he said to God, give me time till the day of resurrection. And after that, he promised and said, what I'm going to do, I will certainly come to them, to, to humans, from before them and from behind them and from their left hand side and from their right hand side so that you will not find them thankful. It is very open uh, mission or um, goal of Satan that he wants all humanity to be unthankful, ungrateful to, to the blessings of God. And I would like to um, close the remarks, my reflections with some practical tips from the teachings of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in uh, Islamic tradition. So what, what are, and how can we be thankful? What are the practical tips? And after uh, listening Rabbi, I see that there are a lot of things kind of overlapping and we share uh, similar uh, practical tips. First one, I can say, don't be greedy for more. If we are greedy, it means that we are not satisfied with the blessings that has been given to us. If we are greedy, it means that we are not content. We are not pleased. If we are given 1,000, we will ask for 10,000. If we are given 10,000, we are going to ask for millions, for billions. Even if we are given everything, we are not going to be thankful because uh, of the nature of being greedy. And the second tip, I can say, be constantly aware of God's blessings. In Quran, God says, Prophet Noah, peace be upon him. Prophet Noah was a thankful servant. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, explaining this verse, saying that Noah never put even a piece of food to his mouth or take a sip of water without saying Alhamdulillah, which is, uh, thanking God, which is praising God. He was so conscious. Even the smallest blessing that he had, he constantly uh, praised God and he constantly uh, thanked God. But thinking about all of the distractions that we have, 
it is uh, really a difficult task that we uh, can keep our uh, faith and our connection uh, strong. And the third uh, tip I can say, uh, it's based on the uh, teaching of Prophet Muhammad. Once he said, there are two things, whoever does them, God will record them as grateful and patient. The first one, to look at people above you when it comes to religion and want to be like them. So uh, when there are people uh, who are so pious, who are so religious, righteous, uh, who are so thankful, so we need to look at them and try to be like them. And the second one is to look at the people below you, below you when it comes to this world. So we can thank for everything uh, God has given us and uh, God is not testing us like them. And think about uh, all of the blessings, very basic uh, fundamental needs that we have today. The safety that we live here, the food that we can have, um, our health and um, our country. And think about the millions of people who, are, who, are, who cannot even meet their fundamental needs like food, like shelter. There are millions of people, they have to flee out of their country and uh, try to find a shelter so they can live here. And being thankful also requires uh, an action. So when we have all of these blessings, so it's our duty to share these blessings uh, with the others so we can truly be thankful. And the fourth practical tip is to praise God, is to have a daily routine that we pray for him and we praise him and also share how thankful we, uh, we are for all of the blessings he, he has given us. And the last one, I think it is so important um, as well. Uh, it is uh, one of the uh, hadith of Prophet Muhammad, saying of Prophet Muhammad. He said, whoever does not thank people for their favor will not be thankful to God properly. So whatever blessings that we have through the people that we have in our life, through our families, our friends, we need to be thankful to those people as well. So we can truly be thankful to God. Thank you so much, Jim. Thank you, Ali. Uh, don't be greedy. Be aware of blessings. Uh, be generous and compassionate. Praise God. And always remember to share gratitude with others. Certainly uh, easy and perfect words for all of us to keep in mind uh, in these days. Friends, our final reflection this evening, uh, I am pleased to welcome Dr. Javier Orozco, who is the uh, Director of the Office of Ecumenical and Interreligious Affairs for the Archdiocese of St. Louis. Uh, Javier is also an IPSDL board member, and we are grateful for his presence with us tonight. Dr. Orozco. Thank you. It's good to be with all of you. In his letter to the Ephesians, the Christian writer Paul states, That is why I, having once heard about your love for all God's holy people, have never failed to thank God for you and to remember you in my prayers. I am struck by Paul's ability and by extension everyone's ability to sustain such an attitude of grace. Ours is a culture that moves from one sentiment to the next with ease and agility. And while we ritually commemorate events and people with profound gratitude, we have to admit that never failing to thank God for things or people would be quite an accomplishment. How does one never fail to give thanks? How do I and you embrace a spiritual disposition of thanksgiving without ceasing? I suspect we each have our ways. For me, part of holding on to gratitude entails connecting to my family history, cultural values, and Catholic spirituality. If there's one memory that is ingrained in my psyche from my family history, and growing up as an immigrant Hispanic in this country, it is the memory of my parents' constant 
and pesky words exhorted me to be grateful. As my mother would say, mijo, se agradecido. My son, be grateful. If there's one virtue an immigrant kid growing up in a poor urban neighborhood has to learn and never forget, it is to be in a perennial state of gratitude, never failing and ceasing to give thanks for everyone and everything. Suffice it to say that material poverty is never an excuse for ingratitude or a disordered pride. This vocation to be infinitely grateful is visible also in the broader cultural value systems we choose to embrace. Growing up in a Latino culture meant that it was next to impossible to move away from having to be grateful for everyone and everything. Among the many things the Latino way of life has taught me over the years has been knowing that the spirit of gratitude runs deep through our cultural veins. Simply put, no amount of intercultural competence can absolve us from saying gracias, thank you to one another. Perhaps more than ever, our intercultural and interfaith encounters need to begin with and by giving thanks for each other's presence, no matter how familiar, uncomfortable, or strange each one of us appears. It is the spirit of gratitude that runs deep through our veins and brings us to this holy ground of encounter. I know from my Catholic spirituality that to gather in a common table of friendship and gratitude is beautiful, good, and true. In fact, the source and summit of my Catholic spiritual discipline is a meal in gratitude with and for others. We call it Eucharist, that is giving thanks for you or gracias making in prayer for one another. Let me end my remarks where I began. Like Paul to the community of Ephesus, like a mother to her child, like a culture placing gratitude over privilege, and like you, I want to never fail to give thanks. Indeed, how wonderful it is to be able to sing gracias, to dance gracias to give gracias away without reserve. May the blessing of gratitude remain here and forever. Amen. Amen, indeed. Gracias, Javier. And let us go and gracias making in to this next day. And may we carry that into all of our lives as well. Tonight has been a uh, a uh, wonderful evening of meditation, reflecting on the importance of gratitude for one's spiritual and emotional well-being and exploring the ways that gratitude is connected to religious practice and mindfulness and, uh, and plenty of tools to take with us uh, into the next couple of days and into the weeks and months uh, ahead. I would like to thank all of our presenters uh, this evening, President Michael Fuller, Dr. Sophia Grewal, uh, Rabbi Andrea Goldstein, Ali, Dur Ali Durhan, uh, and Javier Roscoe, and uh, Amy Cammy for leading us through our medical, uh, musical meditation this evening. We'd also like to thank our sponsors, uh, St. Louis Children's Hospital, the Law Offices of Barnett M. McKee, the Steinberg Family Foundation, Webster University, Dr. Sophia and G.S. Grewal, and Dr. Kristen Lynch. And most importantly, we are Gracias making for all of you uh, who are our generous supporters. If you would like to support uh, more IPSTL programming, I invite you to go to interfaithstl.org slash donate and make a donation today. 
So in a moment, uh, we are going to hear more music from Amy Cammy, and with that, I would uh, like to say good night to all of you and wish you all a happy and safe Thanksgiving. Peace be with you, uh, be safe, and be well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 